A few miles from Chelmorton, on an escarpment above the River Wye, lie field patterns that take us back even further than the Dark Ages. These humps and bumps are the remains of a Romano-British settlement. Altogether, over 50 Roman settlements survive throughout the Peak District as either earthworks or crop marks, but few of the others are as well preserved as here at Cheetor. Built on an isolated rocky spur surrounded on three sides by a deep river gorge, the site has managed to remain largely unaffected by the passing of centuries. The patterns in the landscape reveal a typical rural settlement. The slopes have been partially terraced, creating a series of lynchets, which mark the larger field boundaries. Better defined, but smaller low stony banks mark rectangular lards and their associated houses, with a series of interlinking lanes and small gardening plots above. The Roman Britons who lived here would have farmed cattle, sheep and cereals like wheat and barley, in a way that has changed very little from earlier periods in history. But excavations reveal the definite benefits of Roman occupation. From quality ceramics to intricate jewellery, the Romans also brought new ideas with them, notably for agriculturalists improved drainage techniques so that poorer soils could be cultivated. Most settlements would have produced basic supplies such as food and wool, which as well as being exchanged locally, were traded within the wider empire and proved very important to the Roman legions, which constantly moved up and down the country. During the Roman era, the ownership of farmland was a very important asset, giving its owner a high level of respectability as well as being economically important. The water power, which made many factory owners fortunes in the Victorian era, was also harnessed for the first time in British history, with mechanised mills being constructed to grind the grain. For the first time, our island people would also have enjoyed fine wines, with evidence from pollen excavated at Wollaston in Northamptonshire, strongly suggesting that the Romans introduced the grapevine to Britain. Change in the countryside was much less rapid than would have been experienced in the towns, but over time, a two-tier system developed, with small agricultural communities existing alongside the larger and much grander Roman-designed villas of the ruling elite. There is little evidence for the elite of the Peak District, with only one small villa found near Carsington many decades ago. It is likely that having been built in more agriculturally favourable areas, the villas were obliterated by future farming. The Romans first arrived in Britain in 55 BC. Caesar, then a provincial governor, landed on the Kentish coast with the probable aim of making a political impact back in Rome. Rather than a full-scale conquest, the aim of this visit was to create alliances and form trade links. It was not all plain sailing, however. His full fleet could not land due to bad weather, and he had to fight a small battle against local tribes. Quickly recalled back to Gaul to deal with hostilities there, he returned in a much larger scale in 54 BC. Again landing in Kent, his army progressively marched through the land, capturing major hill forts and subduing the local tribes. He made it across the Thames and as far as Hertfordshire, before taking hostages, agreeing alliances, and returning to Gaul. Caesar's visit had a great impact on the local people he met, with some even adopting Roman coinage and engaging in trading and visits to Rome. But most of Britain remained out of Rome's control, and the situation between the native British tribes was volatile to say the least, each trying to control trade and resources, with minor alliances crumbling as quickly as they were made. It may have been this unpredictable situation that prompted Emperor Claudius to finally invade Britain full scale and bring it under Roman control. Four legions landed in AD 43, the rough equivalent of 20,000 soldiers, and that number does not even take into account the rest of the military machine, engineers, doctors, architects, craftsmen, and the other supporting individuals. The military subjugation of Rome brought about widespread social and economic change. It wasn't just little luxuries such as wine and jewellery, but massive alterations such as a complex system of international trade, an influx of new people and beliefs, and great changes in construction from roads to underground heating, drainage systems, baths, and the list goes on. But not everyone wanted to be part of the great Roman Empire, and in some ways it could be easy to see why. If you agreed to join and sent off your share of goods, soldiers, taxes and even slaves, you were welcome with open hands but those who turned them down felt the full, brutal and often sadistic force of the greatest army on earth. One of the most famous early revolts took place in AD 60, under the great warrior queen Boudicca. Boudicca's husband, Prasutagus, had passed away, leaving half his territories to Rome and half to her. But Rome wanted it all, and politically they did not recognise a female ruler. She was publicly flogged, and her two daughters, thought to be 12 years old at the time, were raped in front of her. The empire then looted hundreds of buildings in a tribal domain and took many of the people away to be slaves. Boudicca, horrified with the atrocities she witnessed, formed an army with the thousand survivors whose lives had been turned upside down. 
Boudicca was a real threat to Roman dominion. She massacred tens of thousands of both civilians and soldiers, with a brutality that surpassed even that of Rome. In Colchester, Boudicca's army sealed over 2,000 Romans in the main temple, where they were all slowly burned alive. While storming the city of London, Decasius gave us a description of a method for torturing the Roman women. Their breasts were cut off and stuffed in their mouths, so that they seemed to be eating them. Then their bodies were skewered lengthwise on sharp stakes. However, this is a Roman account and is a typical ploy of Roman military writing to portray the enemy as uncivilised animals in diametric opposition to civilised Rome. Even though Boudicca's result became a legend, in the end it was crushed by the Roman machine. Her lack of planning was Boudicca's downfall. The push of Roman rule northwards probably reached the Peak District under Governor Acacolas in the late 70s AD. Unlike many areas of the country, there appears to have been little rebellion and the land came under control peacefully. The most important Roman settlement in the Peak District was Aqua Ornamentii, roughly translated as the Waters of Ornamentii, the Goddess of the Sacred Grove, which now lies underneath modern-day Buxton. This was one of only two Roman spa towns in the whole of Britain, the other being Bath in Somerset, over a hundred miles away. Aqua Ornamentii was the site of a large Roman bath complex, taking advantage of the rich mineral water. Associated with the baths would have been the usual amenities of a town, along with a series of temples venerating the gods and goddesses. The site of the baths was underneath the modern crescent, which was constructed by the 5th Duke of Devonshire, who regenerated Buxton as a spa town in the 1770s. While constructing the west wing of the crescent in 1773, a series of Roman buildings were uncovered along with votive offerings spanning four centuries. More modern reconstruction work in 1975 uncovered this votive deposit of over 200 coins, three bronze bracelets and a wire clasp. Although the baths have now closed, the water is still in use today, with St Anne's Well alone giving a regular flow of 2 million litres of free mineral water a day. The Romans had a wide variety of deities and beliefs. One of the main reasons for the empire's success was its embracing of all faiths. When you joined you had to swear an allegiance to Rome, but then you could believe anything you wished. Those hailing from Rome mostly followed the state religion, worshipping the spiritual power of the current and past emperors. But many of the other deities we find venerated in Britain may well be Iron Age survivors. When the Romans first arrived in Britain, large areas were dominated by the pagan Celtic religion. This venerated natural phenomenon and had a multitude of gods and goddesses associated with natural places such as springs and ancient trees. An important part of Celtic society at the time was the order of priests, doctors and other learned professionals known as the Druids. Rome went to great lengths to suppress them, fearing they had the power to organise an uprising, though the other aspects of the pagan Celtic religion were openly tolerated. The Druids passed on their knowledge verbally, leaving no written accounts, so all we know about them comes from a few brief comments found in the works of Roman and Greek authors. Even these should not be taken as written, with many writers probably reporting hearsay or having ulterior motives. However, various themes do emerge and we can probably believe several accounts. The Druids performed their rituals outside, during both the day and night. Forms of worship followed solar patterns, and plants such as oak and mistletoe were both highly venerated and used in rituals. The Druids believed in a type of reincarnation, and in important ceremonies would conduct animal sacrifice. We are not sure how their religious system was organised, or even conclusively how they dressed, most illustrations we now have being the result of the fanciful Victorian imagination. That we know so little is largely down to the Romans, who succeeded in their aim to wipe out the majority of the Druids from Britain. Our present day image of the Druids is due to the Druid revival which began in the late 1800s and was based around a lot of misconceptions held by scholars at the time. The modern Druidic order is also based on neo-Victorian ideas and bears no direct connection to its ancient forebearers. The 3rd century saw the first appearance of Christianity in Britain. Having an oriental origin like several others of the major Roman beliefs and deities, it had spread to the Mediterranean by the 1st century, and in the 4th century the Emperor Constantine made it the state religion. As we have seen, this originally minor creed would go on to have a great impact on the future of Europe. Ideas and beliefs spread through the Roman Empire quickly, mainly due to their excellent communication system. One very important aspect of this was the Roman road network. 
Before the Romans, there was no major interlocking road system through Britain, and only small areas had the advanced building techniques similar to those the Romans introduced so methodically. The coherent network of roads the Romans created linked together all major settlements and forts in Britain. No matter what the weather, the Romans knew their roads would be passable. All the routes were laid out by surveyors and engineers to a simple but highly effective design. A well-constructed embankment was termed an agar, often metalled with gravel and stone. The common image is that Roman roads are totally straight, and indeed many sections are. But when they encountered rough terrain, such as the difficult topography of the Peak District, they made frequent directional changes, as we shall see. Buxton has four major Roman roads leaving from it, with the most distinct course taken by Batham Gate, named in medieval times and simply meaning the road to the town of the Baths. Leaving Buxton, Batham Gate runs northeast through the small village of Peakdale, passing by some of the peak's largest lime workings. After descending to the bottom of Doveholesdale, it follows the route of Smalldale before rising high onto the ridge of Laughman Tor. Here the road resumes a perfectly straight northeast course. After crossing the summit of Kemp's Hill, the modern road leaves its route and the Roman way continues across the fields to Damdale, some light earthworks still visible on its route. Crossing Damdale, the Roman road skirts the side of Broodluck before passing Western House and cutting across the rough moorland. A low circular earthwork is visible from the air here, which could have been a temporary Roman camp. After summiting the homes, the Roman way merges with the modern road to descend the valley sides towards Bradwell. Just above Paradise Farm, the road turns and heads more steeply down to the northern edge of Bradwell where it then joins the main road which travels through Bradwell Dale. Batham Gate terminates at the small Roman fort of Navio. Built on a commanding spur above the River No, it was at the meeting point between two important northeast and southwest routes. The Roman soldiers who lived here would have offered protection to the surrounding communities and also brought in a much needed income to the area. The first fort was constructed in AD 78, during the Roman governor Agricola's push north. It was built of timber and earth with a series of large defensive ditches encompassing it. The fort covered just over three acres and outside of its gate to the southeast was a small civilian settlement termed Avicus. The people living here would have provided important services for the garrison stationed at the fort. The Romans had a vested interest in the Hope Valley, and the reason for that lies in the depths of the hills above me. Tacitus believed that Britannia was full of silver and gold, but here they found a different kind of treasure, lead and lead was used and exploited all over the Roman Empire, from being cast into ingots and trinkets to weaponry and even lead coffins. After extraction, the lead would have been smelted into ingots known locally as pigs for transport. Several survive stamped with the word Lutudarum, which is the likely name of the Peak District ore field, or at least its administrative centre. The original wooden fort did not stand for long, being abandoned around AD 120 when all available troops were called north to help with the building of Hadrian's Wall. Even though the fort was abandoned, the Vicus, which was probably completely subsistent for its income on the fort, remained. It was still by an important trade route, and maybe the occupants suspected the Romans would be returning. Just over 30 years later, they did. A revolt by the local Brigantine tribe meant the Romans need to strengthen their presence in the area, not only to defend the local people, but also to protect the much used trade routes. This time they were here to stay and the fort was rebuilt in stone. The second fort was much smaller in extent than the first, roughly equating to about two acres in size. 
At this size it would never have held a full garrison, or at least if it did, they would have been very cramped. The walls that were constructed around the edge of the fort were a massive 7 foot in width and 20 foot high. In fact, so well constructed was the masonry for all the buildings on site that the remains of many of them were still visible in the 1700s. Sadly though now, very little remains, most of it having been robbed for use in local building and construction works. The only stonework that's visible on the site of Navio Fort is found in the centre of the complex. These jumbled boulders are the remains of the underground Principa building or the headquarters and they were uncovered during excavations in 1903. You can easily tell they're pieces of Roman masonry because of the characteristic diamond broaching pattern that's carved into each of the large slabs. Two inscribed slabs were discovered during the excavation, which can be seen in the fascinating Roman collection of the local Buxton Museum. The first inscription tells us several important things. One, the Emperor Antonius Pius was in power when the fort was reconstructed in stone. He ruled the empire from the 10th of July AD 138 after the death of his adoptive father, the Emperor Hadrian, until his death by natural causes on the 7th of March AD 161. Secondly, the soldiers stationed at the fort were an auxiliary infantry regiment, originally recruited from among the Aquitanian tribes who inhabited several regions of southwestern France, with their capital town, Berdigala, now under the modern-day Bordeaux. The regiment had around 500 foot soldiers, but the small size of Navio suggests as little as 250 of the unit were ever stationed there, perhaps being redeployed to a nearby now lost fort. And thirdly, the proprietor, Gnaeus Julius Verus, was appointed Governor of Britain, probably in AD 154 and most certainly in AD 158, which gives us an even more specific date range for the reconstruction of the fort. The second altar stone gives us two facts of interest, although the Latin is a little harder to decipher. Firstly, the stone was dedicated by Aelius Motio, which, although abbreviated, gives us the name of a local Roman soldier. And secondly, the stone is dedicated to the goddess Onomecte, which is probably a Celtic water deity associated with the local river. The fort at Navio was finally abandoned in around 350 AD along with the Vicus. This was not a local decision but rather a national one. By the 4th century the Roman Empire knew that it was in trouble. Along with the ever-present political struggles and instability, the barbarian tribes were increasing their attacks on various fronts. Occupying Britain, on the very edge of the empire, was becoming increasingly difficult. In the history books, 410 AD is given as the end of Roman rule in Britain, but it is far less simple than that. When we study the evidence, we find a gradual withdrawal over the preceding decades. Raids from the Irish led to the abandonment of the West in 383 AD, the Picts caused the furthest frontier of Hadrian's Wall to be relinquished in 401, and Saxons led to the desertion of the southeast in 407. That same year, the last Roman troops left Britannia to help defend Gaul. In 409, the remaining Roman magistrates were expelled from cities, maybe by distant peasants, but in truth for reasons unknown. So where do we get the date 410 AD from? It comes from a letter sent by the Emperor Heronius refusing aid to Britain, stating that the people should look to their own defence. This is the official date when the Roman Empire said farewell. The Roman era was truly a contradictory period in English history. Tacitus proclaimed Britannia Pretium Victoriae, a land worth the conquering. Over four centuries the Empire massacred countless Britons, destroyed an ancient religious system and committed devastating atrocities. But they also brought with them great advances and changed the shape of our land and history forever. However, by 410 AD, with the Empire in its dying throes, their priorities lay elsewhere. What did the Romans ever do for us? It's not as simple as the Pythons would have it. By the mid-5th century, Britain was in disarray, the time known as the Dark Ages. The remains of the Empire were crumbling, and no matter how much people tried to hold on to the magnificent buildings and nationwide networks, it was too late. The land was changing once more. But the Dark Ages were not as black as some people may think. As we have seen, it may have been a bloody period, but it was also the start of the flowering of many of the great works of literature, a time of magnificent lives and creations, and the period when, after four centuries of outside control, we began to forge our own future. To find a real Dark Age, 
we need to go back to the time before the arrival of Caesar in 55 BC. No longer can we refer to any documents or manuscripts. Britain BC is one without written records, where the only information we can find lies buried within the earth. And it is within the earth we realise how startlingly our prehistoric ancestors influenced both our social and natural landscapes. Looking at me. Go on. Go. Go. I'm not going in the right direction. You're filming it, aren't you? <laughs>